several, several important rulings from the Florida Supreme Court this week. Let's start with abortion. There were two decisions on abortion Monday. First, the high court cleared the way for the state to ban most abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. That's before many women know they are pregnant. There are some exceptions for cases involving rape, incest, and fetal abnormalities, as well as to save a mother's life. Under the law passed by the legislature and approved by the court, the six-week ban on abortions is scheduled to take place beginning early next month. This will be the largest public health crisis that will be created after the overturn of Roe v. Wade. We are the third most populous state in the nation, and we are surrounded almost entirely by water. Where we aren't surrounded by water, we're surrounded by bans, or states that already have abortion bans in effect. In the other decision on abortion, the court voted four to three to allow a proposed constitutional amendment to be on the ballot this November to protect access to abortion up to fetal viability, which occurs after 23 weeks. The amendment would need the support of 60 percent of voters to pass. Florida's Republican House Speaker opposes the measure. It is extreme in its focus. It would be one of the most extreme uh, laws in the, in the country as well as around the world should it pass. So Tara, let's start with the first decision about abortion. In just a few weeks, the six-week ban on abortion goes into effect here in Florida. How's that going to affect women here in the state of Florida? Anytime you affect women's access to health care or dignity, you're going to affect women. And so this is going to cause a chilling effect for women to access health care, reproductive rights, and actually make us a very unfavorable state um, in terms of women's rights overall. And this is very surprising to us since we see that the polling numbers are showing that most Floridians are in support of access to reproductive rights. It's also interesting because there's clear voter enthusiasm for access. We saw that you know the requirement for the petition was only 800,000. We had way more than that, and 35 percent of that was independents and Republicans. And so this is not just a women's issue. This is a, a human rights issue to some, and I think that we need to be watching. But that's not the only thing that we need to be watching for it, because women are also going to be coming out to vote for the rest of the ballot. And there's one person we haven't really been talking about that much with this, is that abortion is going to drive a lot of people to come out and vote about Rick Scott. You know, he came on record that he does not support um, anything more than uh, six-week access to reproductive freedom. Um, he's mixing that conversation with his take on Social Security reform. And I think a lot of voters are going to be looking at that and remembering about his Medicare uh, defraud charges, and he might be in a real uh, sticky situation. He's always had a close election, so I think abortion is, of course, important, but it's also going to drive the other issues on the ballot. Yeah, I want to get deep into the politics in just a little bit, but Steve, let me ask you this. 84,000 women had abortions here in Florida last year. A good number of them, about 9,300, I believe, came from out of state. If, if we essentially almost nearly shut down access to abortion in Florida, beginning in the first part of May, where do those women go? If they can afford it, they're going to go to places like Massachusetts, they're going to go to Illinois, a uh, long way from here. And many of these women are, you know, have financial pressures in addition to the, the pressures of, a, of an unplanned pregnancy. Uh, I think that the, by the time people go to vote in November on Amendment 4, this state will have had to live for six or seven months with this. Paul Renner thinks the ballot initiative is extreme. The six-week ban is even more extreme. It's one of the most restrictive in the country. And so th against that backdrop, I think that the six-week ban itself is going to be, be an effective effort to mobilize public support uh, for it. I'm a little more skeptical than, than Tara is about the ability of this issue to drive other vote choices on the ballot. Florida voters historically, I'm sad to say, I love this state, but they're not very good at connecting the dots sometimes. People have will, faith, have oh, faith, oh, have oh, faith. Oh, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to. But people will vote for the ballot initiative, and they'll also vote for Trump or Rick Scott. I'm not saying everybody, but I'm thinking it's, it's still a major uh, effort. But I'm seeing tremendous amount of enthusiasm right off the bat for, from Democrats, and this is going to be an effective way for Democratic candidates to raise money, this issue. Mm -hmm. Buffet, let me ask you a legal question. That is that... Uh, the uh, judges uh, who are on the Florida Supreme Court, most of them, five of them were appointed by Governor Ron DeSantis, a conservative. Uh, some, uh, some people are angry, right to life people are angry because they see this uh, measure that's going to be on the ballot in November and they say some of or all of uh, DeSantis's appointees approved the measure. But the other, the other concern that people have is that they say if you go back 30 years and look at precedent, we have in our state constitution, a privacy clause. 
And the court has always upheld that and said that does apply to abortion. In this case, this court overturned the precedent and said it doesn't apply to abortion. How, when, a, when a court overturns precedent, how do you view that? You're a former judge, how do you view that? Well, I will answer that in two parts. First, with respect to your question about people being upset at the judges. Judges have to make hard decisions, and judges should not be making decisions based on political ideology. Judges should be making decisions based on what the law is and not what they believe in, and that's one of the hardest things about being a judge. A lot of people think that the tough job of a judge is making the hard decision as far as whether they're gonna send somebody to prison for a long time, but no, the hard decisions really have to do when you're going against what you believe in and what the public is expecting you to do, and you have to go otherwise because of what the law says. Mm -hmm. So that's what I will say to those voters. With respect to the precedent, you know, when I was reading the decision actually took me back to my undergrad years when I was studying philosophy of law at the University of Washington in Seattle, one of the most liberal um, universities in the, in the country. And we were dealing with Roe v. Wade. And I remember studying that and thinking, well, of course it's the right to privacy. And I remember our professor talking about, and this is when I learned that judges a lot of times they already know what decision they want and they will interpret the law and the Constitution whichever way they want in order to get that result. And when you really start to look at it, it has nothing to do with privacy. And as I was reading the decision from the Supreme Court on the issue of the injunction, it was the exact, exact same rationale. There is really nothing about privacy uh, related to abortion. And when people were upset about Roe v. Wade being overturned, um, I thought that it was the right decision because it put the, the decision back on the states, the power on the states and the elected officials of the people. So. Okay, so uh, Daryl, uh, pro-choice groups gathered between May of last year and January of this year, 1.45 million signatures on this ballot issue to get it on the ballot and, and protect abortion rights if Florida voters pass it by 60%. What does it say to gather that many signatures in that amount of time? It says that people are engaged. They've heard what the Supreme Court said. They've seen what the legislature has passed. And the good news is that they're gonna be living under this six week ban for six or seven months before they go to the uh, polls and they'll see the effect, the draconian effect of that six week ban. But it has energized women all across this state and in every other state that was a re reliably red state when this was on the ballot, they voted to give a woman choice, control over her own body. And I think that they'll show up at the polls in mass.